Hi, I'm Pastor Jerry Gerardo with Lighthouse Christian Church in Novato. And this is Ed Mabry with FaithByReason.net. How are you doing, uh, Pastor Jerry? Uh, I'm, I'm doing well. And as we were talking prior, we're in the middle of a three-day fast here, yeah. and it's just been a real extraordinary time pressing in for breakthroughs, for personal things, and surrendering all aspects of our life to Christ, and, and doing it corporately as well, and also praying and pressing in and fasting for our community and the nation. Yes. We have an election today, so really important things going on, and we need to continue to pray and press in on the Lord for his will, that his will be done in our lives, in our communities, in our country, and in this world. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And how are you? Uh, I am good. I, I am doing the fast al along with you and along with Lighthouse Church and for the same reasons, for, for a personal breakthrough, for just continuing to get closer to God because you, you know, when you fast, when you're fasting, it, it takes your attention off yourself and it, and it puts it on, on, on God. And, 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 you know, Jesus fasted all the time. The disciples fasted a lot. And, and, you know, they were doing it for that reason, just to keep your focus on what's important. And of course, you Ab know, absolutely. Our breakthrough it's, it's for our country. Yeah. yeah, thank you. No, it's just a tremendous spiritual weapon. Yeah. But uh, hey, we, we were excited to be talking again this week about your teaching series here in Revelation. It's just outstanding. I've enjoyed every moment of it, every episode of it. The episode that we find ourselves in today is the letter to the church in Sardis, but it's a part, part one. Yeah. We know there's part one and there's going to be part two. Uh, but as I was following your video, I was really fascinated by many of your explanations. But you know, I think the first thing was the fact that this church in Sardis, um, the Lord's writing them saying, hey, you have this reputation that you're alive, but you're actually dead. Explain that, Ed. <laughs> sure. So <laughs> Sardis is, is the fifth church we, in, in the seven letters of seven churches. So church number five is Sardis. And yeah, as you said, Jesus told them that they have a, a, a name or a reputation that they are alive, but they're actually dead. So what does that mean? How can a church be dead? Well, we have to, have to look at the definitions, biblically speaking, of what life and death are. And generally speaking, life is the ability to repair and grow physically and spiritually. Physically, we know that, that we're alive and we continue to repair any damage that's done to our bodies. You know, our, our, our bodies are constantly being assaulted by environmental things and, and, and pathogens and things like that. But when we can repair, we can we stay alive. And of course, when we continue to grow, our cells divide. So that's how we, uh, that, that's how we are, are able to be alive physically. But it's the same spiritually. The two things that keep you spiritually alive is repair and growth. But spiritually, you repair by repenting. The Bible mm. makes it very clear. You repent. I mean, you turn away from what you're doing and you and you put it behind you and you go forward. So you grow. So you you put what's go, what's wrong behind you and yeah. you go forward. So the problem with Sardis is that they weren't doing that. They had a reputation that they were a living, repenting church, but they actually weren't. And if you look, it's interesting about the, the actual historical Sardis. Um, Sardis was actually, it was, it was a, obviously an actual city in ancient um, Asia Minor, modern day Turkey. And they were a small city, but they, what they really were is uh, the equivalent of, a, a equivalent of a castle on a hill, a very steep hill. And it looked like it was impenetrable, that armies could not climb up that hill and get to Sardis. So Sardis had a reputation as a, a stalwart and an indefensible city. I mean, I, I'm sorry, an unconquerable city, excuse me. Right. But as it turned out, there was actually a weakness that could be exploited. And one of the army, one, a Greek army, um, they discovered that weakness and they easily conquered Sardis. It turned out they mm -hmm. weren't that invulnerable. So it's interesting that Jesus has his play on words where, yes. it, it, and of course, since he, you know, the way he, he speaks on all these different levels to the church, he, he picks church, this church at Sardis to just as, as a visual, I'm not done just a visual, but actually a real life example of a place that had a reputation of, of being a stalwart, but was in fact quite vulnerable. Wow, that's that's really a great explanation, and I get it how that can be true, where something seems alive, but at the very core of it, it's 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 not. Right. And so sometimes appearances can be deceiving, but no one deceives the Lord. He knows exactly where we're at. He knows where a church would be. He knows about a community. So so that's really helpful. Now there there are some things, interestingly enough, where there. I'm not going to call them real full commendations, but he does recognize in the church in Sardis that, that there are some 
who haven't soiled themselves, as he says, and, and are going to wear white linen. So explain that part of the letter. Sure. So while he gave the church in general, you know, the, the uh, kind of a bad report card saying they were dead, he sees, like, as you said, there were some in Sardis who hadn't. And, but we have to look, to, uh, go like a verse back and look at what he, what his, what his, um, his, his, his recommendation was to them, um, mm -hmm. his admonition. And he said to be watchful. So yeah. they, they were not being watchful. That's another thing that they were doing wrong. And what does watchful means? It means being alert, of course, being alive. And, right. they were, and in, in their dead theology, they just figured, hey, we're fine. We don't need to repent. So we're not watching. So the people who were doing well were the ones who were watchful. They, so Jesus also said that, you know, hold on to what you have, that, mm. that you don't lose it. So there was something they were doing right. So there was yes. so whatever you're doing right. And in this case, it was salvation doctrine. We'll talk about this a little bit more next week. But Sardis had their salvation doctrine right. They need to hold on to that. Yes. And be watchful, because he said, if you are not watchful, I will come upon you as a thief. Now, a lot mm. of us, when we see that word that you know, Jesus will come upon you as a thief, he comes as, as a thief in the night, we say, oh, well, that means he's going to come and take us somewhere. Technically, yes. And we'll talk about that um, a little bit down the road, especially when we, when we talk about the, the rapture. But what does a thief come to do? A thief does not come to, to, to bring you good tidings. A thief no. comes to take something from you. So yes. Jesus is saying, if you telling this church, if you guys aren't watchful, I'm going to come and I'm going to take something from you. Yeah. And he gives them a very dire warning that if you don't do it, their names will be blotted out from the book of life. That if that doesn't frighten you, you know, you yeah. have something wrong. Are you, you, but as you said, there were some in Sardis who had not, who, who were alive. I think in each one of the churches, even the churches that had things going on, there were, there's always a remnant in that church that's doing the right thing. And these are the ones that Jesus said, hold on, and I will give you the white garments. And, and those white garments represent righteousness. And so you, you're doing right, hold on to what you have, and you'll get the righteousness from me. Right, right. Yeah, well, I think so many important aspects to that message, which is, you're right, it is a dire warning. It's a really serious calling out. Wake up, he says, and just, you, need to, you need to repent, you need to change. Uh, and, but for some whose heart were in a better place, who were holding fast, it was a, a recommendation to stay strong, to press on. And so that's reassuring too, because we can be in an environment where we're surrounded sometimes maybe by others who aren't sincere. And the Lord's always looking for sincerity in following him, in, in pursuing what he wants for us. So I love the fact that God deals with us as individuals and it's our personal walk. And then in community, it makes a big difference if there's so many of us who are truly seeking to honor God and follow him closely. God is blessed by that and he will reward that even though he won't reward everything. He can't reward things that are not appropriate. Right. But, so keep yeah. in mind that each one of these church messages end with, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church is, which means it applies to all of us. So all of us have areas in our lives where we mirror the seven churches. And all of us have areas in our lives where we appear to be one thing. We appear to be yeah. all good, pious Christians. But you go behind closed doors, well, you know, everything's not rosy. Everything's not perfect. I talked about that a little bit in the video. Well, you have, you know, the model family going to church dressed to their, in their Sunday yeah. family. Then you get home, the father's yelling at the wife, the kids are out r running here and there, you know, there's, you know, the wife is gossiping, the husband's on pornography, but oh, but you see him on Sunday, oh, they look like the perfect church. That's yeah. not, he's not interested in your appearance, he's interested in the heart. So he's right. telling us, and we, again, we all have an area, so I have areas in my life, you and your life, everyone does, where we yeah. come off as a, a certain way, but in truth, we're not growing. So right. Jesus gives the churches these messages so that we can, not, not to beat us down, not to beat the churches down, but to say, hey, here's where you can turn away from these things. I'm bringing them to your attention. Turn away from them. Come back to me and get the reward. Yeah, and there's a real clarity, actually, that Christ is saying, hey, I'm going to be honest with you because I need to be in love and tell you where you're messing up. If somebody doesn't tell you where you're messing up, growing up, my parents told me, hey, this is wrong, son. You need... It, it, then we're on the wrong path and we're doing further damage. But when God tells us, hey, you're messing up here or there, correct it. Repent, go through a process of change, 
honor the Lord. And he's right there to reward us and bless us as we follow him, which is also very clear. There are rewards set in front of us for simply following Christ in this life. So again, another outstanding message. And uh, as I said, as I got to the end of that video clip, I said, oh, now we get to the prophetic. I really want to see what Ed has here and how we're going to process this. But that'll be for next week. So tell us what's coming. Right. And so I actually recorded this all as one uh, uh, video before, but then it, it went really long. It went well over an hour. And I thought, I don't want to keep people on the, on the hook for that long. So yeah. I split it in two. So in, in the one that in the, in the current part one, we just deal with the historic, with the personal application and with the congregational application. And I go through the entire verse. Um, yeah. of the, all, of the entire section on the, on the Church of Sardis in uh, chapter three of Revelation. But in next week, we're going to look at it from the prophetic standpoint, because um, as, 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 as my theory is going, and it's, it's agreed on by, by many um, uh, uh, Bible teachers, that these seven churches represent these seven eras of our church history. And since the last church we looked at, Thyatira, would represent kind of the Roman church of the, the, the medieval times up until the time of the Renaissance, but well, then the next church would represent the Protestant Reformation. And we're all, I know you and I are, are technically children of that Reformation because we, right. we're, we're that those are the kind of Christians we are. However, something about it rendered that move rendered a, a dead aspect there was something dead about it even though it did fantastic things and i and i can tell you that touched me personally because i'm like wait a minute i'm i i'm a protestant and jesus right. is saying that there's some dead theology well there are there as you said there's some good and there's some bad we're going to talk about all of that and how, we're going to talk about the protestant reformation and how it relates to where where um what, what jesus is talking about and where we are going forward yeah, well, that's great. That's going to be a great study and conversation as well. So we will definitely look forward to that. So, brother, thanks so much again for uh, being a part of this. And, and I love this interview process, but the video teaching is outstanding, Ed. So thank you very much for all that you've invested in it and continue to do for us and our benefit. So God bless you. I'm going to ask everyone who's tuning in to make sure that you jump on faithbyreason.net, that you subscribe, that you click for notifications, put in comments, click like. I mean, this there's a lot here, and we just want people to continue to be engaged with this teaching. So God bless you, Ed, and God bless all. Same to you, Jerry. God bless you, and I will talk to you next week. Thanks, brother. Hugs to your family. Thank you. Bye-bye.